Good morning. Welcome to Manna from Heaven with Sharon Gaines Lee. Thank you for joining me again this morning. I am so happy to be here and I am excited about our topic. Really excited about it. And I think you'll be too. I mean, our t- my topic today is hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. Trouble pla- the trouble place of your training. This is the trouble place of of your training, of you walking with God, because we, we would like to be trained in everything is perfect, everything is going right, we're making all the right decisions, everybody around us is making the right decisions, and so we think out of that place should our training should come, but actually that's not really scriptural. We learn more stuff in the midst of trials. We learn how, how to connect with God, how to lean on Him, how to trust with Him, how to move into peace. I mean, we learn a lot from that, even though emotionally we don't like that, but that's where we learn the most. So this podcast is called Hidden in Plain Sight, Tr- that troubled place of your training. So bear with me a little bit here. So Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, you said we're two or more are gathered in your name that you are in our midst, Father. And we thank you for being here with us, Father. We thank you, Father, that you hear our hearts cry. You see where we are, where we're going to be. And Father, you are already where we're going to be. You're already there and you're here present with us, Father. So Father, we thank you for your manna, for giving to us something that we can work together with you in, Father. And Father, we thank you, Father, that we would begin to see what's around us. Father, you have given us help, Father. You have given us help that's right around us. And Father, we ask, Father, I ask you now in this morning that you would help us to utilize what you have given us to its fullest capacity, Father. You are God and we are not, Father. So Father, train us and help us to work together with you in a deeper way this morning and forth. So thank you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. It is so. So the topic today is hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. Have you ever looked for your glasses? I know I've done this. I've looked for my glasses. Where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? And I'm looking and they're on top of my head. Have you ever done that? Come on. Somebody's done it besides me. Raise your hand even though I can't see you. Or I have done this before, and this is the silliest. I'm looking for my keys. Where are my keys to get my car? Where I just had my keys. Where are they at? And then it's like, um, Sharon, you got your keys in your hand. I'm gathering everything, and so I'm doing try, trying to do more than one thing at a time. And then di- didn't realize that my keys were in plain sight. And so, I mean, I could go upstairs and look. I can go downstairs and look. I can go in the other room and look. And I can just look all around and I can yell for somebody. Did you see my keys? Or, you know, but it's in plain sight. I just don't see it. And sometimes that's where we are spiritually. The things that we need pertaining, pertaining to life and godliness is right before us. Our deliverance is right before us, but we don't see it. It's in plain sight, but we don't see it. And another example for that could be, I'll just give you a more spiritual example. It could be maybe you're believing the Lord for something in your body. You're, you're going through something in your body and you're saying, God, I asked you, you said in your word that you have sent your word and you healed me from all of my diseases. And so you're trusting God and the thing we should do, we should trust God and believe God for something because God is not a man that he would lie. He's, he's truthful. He never lies. He never thinks about lying. So I understand the dynamics of that. But there are times as we walk and we're working together with God in, in things and, and we're listening for the voice of the Lord and how to respond. And then it could be, listen to me, that what's before you is, is the result of your deliverance this particular time could be you need to forgive somebody. And so you're looking at everything, you're fasting, you're praying, you're anointing yourself with oil, you're taking um, communion every morning, you're doing everything except forgiving. Why? Because that person hurt you, you're mad, you're upset, you don't know how to overcome this in the flesh, and you don't in the flesh. That's why you got to step up and lean into spiritual places. But you and you, But God is whispering to you, um, Sharon, you need to forgive her. Sharon, you need to forgive But I don't want to forgive her. But I'm not going to say that because it's not spiritual to say I don't want to forgive them. Or we'll say stuff like, um, well, um, um, and I, I, I've, I've said this to somebody. I've said, you know, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against um, spiritual principles. And, you know, you know the scripture. 
And a particular person said to me, I know, I know that. I know that scripture. That's a sentence, a word I, I really hate a lot. I know, I know, I know. I, if you know, why are you in this situation? Oh, I know. And, and they said to me, but they did it deliberately. I said, but if there wasn't an addendum on that scripture, it wasn't that um, you have to forgive, but they have to know it. I mean, there, there wasn't a, an addendum to that. God said, forgive. And a matter of fact, he said, forgive 70 times seven. I think what he meant there is stop counting. He didn't mean to go, okay, 69, um, seven, um, 67, 60. I don't think he meant that. He meant that he wants us to lavish people in the love of God, even if they've hurt us lavish them in the love of God and lavishing somebody in the love of God is not you saying what they did was all right. Forgiving somebody is not saying what they did to you was all right. You're saying, you're saying to yourself, I will not be bound by this thing. And so let's go ahead with this. I, I wanted to start there, there, but I'm getting too far in it. And I have, I'm um, hidden in plain sight. And the example I gave you with the glasses and the keys. And most of the time we want to pray pain away, whether it be physical, spiritual, or natural trouble, excuse me, trouble is our place of training. Listen to that. Trouble is our place of training. If you're in a trouble situation right now, God wants to train you in it. He wants to train you in it. I mean, you have to, have to and I, I say this a lot. You'll hear me say this a lot on my podcast that if you have to go through a trial, utilize it. You don't want to go into the trial. You don't want to come out of the trial the same way you came into it. You don't. So if you have to go through it, utilize it, use it. Don't go out of it worse or the same as you went into it. So trouble is our place of training. Your reaction says everything. Your reaction is important here. You may want to ignore your reaction or act like that part of, of, of your relationship with God is insignificant. <laughs> Ignore my cat in the background. We tend to magnify the hurt more than anything else. We tend to magnify the hurt more than anything else. But God says different. And his opinion is really the only one that counts. Hidden in plain sight. Your reaction shows who you really are and where you're really at in, in that stage in your life. We want to act like... Um, how, how we respond to people openly is what sh is, is who, who we really are. Let me say that. We want to act, act like the way we respond to people openly is the way is who we really are. But it's not hidden in plain sight. In Samuel 1, um, in Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel is unable to recognize God's voice. The Lord calls Samuel. The boy Samuel ministers before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were many, there were not many visions. Only one night though, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel answered, here I am. And he, he ran to Eli and said, you know the story. Here I am. You, did you call me? But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lied down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up again and went to Eli and said, here I am. Did you call me? My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet, excuse me, know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel went out and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Listen to this. Because the word is given to us. There's a collection of a lot of things that took place on the stage of human history. And God took a collection, a specific collection to train us in. And this was one of the parts of the things that took place on the stage in human history that God wanted us to glean and work out of. And so 
go and lie down, Eli said to, his, to Samuel, and say to the Lord, speak for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling. The Lord came and stood there calling as calling as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Listen to that word tingle because it represents something. And that time I will carry out against, at that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin his family, because of the sin his family forever, because of the sin of his family, because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed me, God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was said to you, Eli asked, do not hide it from me. My God, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely. If you, if you hide from me anything, he told you, don't do that. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. Listen to this. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. He let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And that's important, especially if you're a prophetess or a prophet or you give the word of the Lord or I mean the ac the accuracy of your words depend on, depends on your connection and your um the way that, the way that you listen to, to God and you present that word. If you if your emotions are all intertwined in the word of the Lord and the sum of God, you know, 95% of what God said and two percent, you know, 95% of what you feel about it and two percent of what God says, um, a lot of your words are going to fail. And so that's why in the midst of trials, in that intense time in our lives, God trains us because it's in that time that we see whether we're yielding or not. I mean, if you, if your finances are all good, everything is in order, your kids are doing good, you have, um, you know, you're, you're making millions or thousands or whatever you, you know, you think is good for you and everything is going well. That is not a good, necessarily a good training ground. Everybody praises God really from that point of view. Most people do. Most people will praise God in it, but in the midst of a trial, it shows who we really are. Our response shows who we really are and what we really believe. The Lord was with Sam, Samuel as he grew up and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground and all Israel from Dan to, from Dan to Beersheba, Beersheba, I hope I'm saying that right, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord, the Lord continued to appear at Sh at Salome. Uh -huh. The Lord continued to appear and there there and revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Shiloh, I'm sorry. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And in 1 Samuel 3, God speaks to Samuel. Samuel is unable to recognize God's voice. Remember that? The scarcity of revelation in Israel. Then the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. The boy Samuel ministered to the Lord for the third time, it is emphasized that Samuel ministered to the Lord, and that was in 1 Samuel 2.11 and in 2.18. Just as Aaron and his sons did at their consecration as priests in Exodus 29. 
and just as Paul and Barnabas did before they were sent on their, on their missionaries. And that was, you know, in Acts 13, verse 1 and 2. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. The only word of the Lord we read of in the first two chapters of 1 Samuel is the word of judgment brought by the man of God against Eli. God didn't speak often, and when he did, it was a word of judgment. Generally, in those days, it was a word of judgment. The word of the Lord was rare in those days because of the hardness of hearts among the people of Israel and the excuse me, and the corruption of the priesthood, God did speak. God will speak and God will speak and guide when his people seek him and when his ministers seek to serve him diligently. God's first word to Samuel, and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God, he went out into the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. And while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. His eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. This was true both spiritually and physically of Eli. His age made him an an ineffective leader for Israel. Before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord as a figure of speech, you know, this, this simply means before dawn, but it is also suggestive of the dark spiritual time of Israel during that time. It is dark and will probably get darker. And it did. Exodus 27 in, and in Exodus 27, 21, um, I hope you're writing some of these things down. I should have told you to write um, write these scriptures down. down. But um, you can inbox me and I'll give them to you. But in Exodus 27, 21, it refers to the responsibility of the priest to tend to the lamp until sunrise or just before dawn. While, while Samuel was lying down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. He don't know for certain how, we don't know for certain how old Samuel was during that time. The anxious, the ancient Jewish historians um, suggest that he was around 12 years old, but, but nobody knows for sure. However old he was, God spoke to Samuel and he answered, here I am, Lord, here I am. His, this led us to believe that God spoke to Samuel in an audible voice instead of in his inner voice. Though this is not certain, but Samuel was so impressed by what he heard, he responded by saying, here I am. This is a beautiful way to respond to God's word. It isn't that God does not know where we are, of course not, but it tells God and it reminds us that we are simply before him as servants, asking what he wants us to do. Samuel is, Samuel is amongst several others who also said, here I am. When the Lord spoke to Abraham in Genesis, when the Lord spoke to Joseph, I mean Jacob in Genesis, and when he spoke, spoke to um, Moses in Exodus, and in Isaiah, he spoke to Isaiah, and in and Ananias in, um, in Acts. Samuel doesn't recognize God's voice, so he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me, I know you did. And he said, I did not call, lie down again, Samuel. And he went and lie down and lay down. When the Lord called yet again Samuel, so Samuel arose and went to Eli, Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. Then he arose and and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived this time that the Lord had called the boy. Now, really, I'm just going to say this real quick. Eli should have perceived that a long time ago. So you see how dull of hearing Eli was at that time. And I'll start right there. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go, lie down, and it shall be. If he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his, in his place. He ran to Eli. He ran to Eli. Samuel was 
an obedient boy. He was wrong in thinking Eli spoke to him, but he was right in what he did. Samuel came to Eli quickly because he knew Eli was blind and might need help. And the Lord called yet again. When speaking to us, God always confirms his word again and again and again. Let me repeat that again. When speaking to us, when God is speaking to us, he always, not sometimes, he always confirms his word again, again, and again. God does that throughout the word. I mean, we can use it in the same when we think of somebody going to hell. I mean, God doesn't just say, oh, you, you disobeyed me, and he gives you one chance, hell, be gone. God gives us, he is slow to anger, he is rich in loving kindness, and he is slow to anger. That's who he is. And so here it says, and the Lord called yet again when speaking to us. God always confirms his word again and again. It is generally wrong to do something. Oh gosh, it is generally wrong to do something dramatic in response to a single inner voice from God. God won't do, do that because he loves us so much. If God speaks, he will confirm often in a variety of ways. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Samuel was a godly and obedient boy serving God wonderfully, yet he had not yet even given his heart to the Lord. Even children raised in a godly home must be converted by the spirit of God. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Eli gave Samuel wise counsel. Eli told Samuel to make himself available for God to speak. Go lie down. See, Sam, it wasn't that Eli did not know what to do. Eli just wasn't doing it for himself. So he told him to make himself available to God and lie down and God will speak to him again. So we're not to be presumptuous about God speaking. If he calls us, we don't have to be presumptuous because God is clear. It's not that when God says his sheep hear his voice is we don't have to have 12 steps on how to hear the voice of God. Really, we don't. I know there are books that say that, but God has, when he created us, he made us to hear his voice. He made us. You don't have to train a baby to, to know your voice. A baby knows your voice. So because he was created to know that. So we are sheep as God's sheep. We hear the shepherd's voice. Now, we can say when we hear the shepherd's voice, sometimes we don't like what he says or we think his timing is off. So then we're going to say, God, is it you or is it the devil or is it me? I mean, we can play those games because we don't like God's timing and we don't like what he says. But his sheep hear his voice. So let me go back here. So respond to God's word. Respond to the word of God because God. God, and, and God spoke to him. So we were to, he, he humbled himself before God and his word. Your servant hears. Speak, Lord. We must hear from God. The preacher may say it. Our parents may speak. Our friends may speak. Our teachers may speak. Those on the radio, I guess that includes me, or television may speak. That is all fine, but their voices mean nothing for eternity unless God speaks through them. God's message to Samuel. Samuel responds just as Eli told him. He listened to his teacher, his instructor. Now the Lord came and stood and called as other times. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord came and stood and called. This seems to have been an audible voice this time because the, because the Lord stood over him. It may be that it was a unique appearing of the Lord, perhaps in the person of Jesus before Bethlehem. This was not a dream or a state of altered consciousness. And that was and in verse verses 11 through 14, God, God's message to Samuel, the coming judgment on Eli and his house. The Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it, hears that word, will tingle. Tingle represents judgment. I'll say that. I'll tell you that. And so in that day, I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. 
And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Both ears of everyone who hears will tingle. That's judgment. God will give young Samuel a spectac will give young Samuel spectacular news. In other words, in the Old Testament, tingling here, tingling ears are a sign of an especially severe judgment. Not just judgment, but severe judgment. And that's in Second Kings and in Jeremiah um, nineteen three. For I have told him that I will judge his house through the word of the man of God in First Samuel two. Eli already heard of the judgment to come. His, this word to young Sam, Samuel was a word to confirm the previous message from God. The Lord sends his word of threatening by a child, for God has many messengers. Hmm. The Lord sends him a word of threatening by a child, for God has many messengers. For the iniquity which he um, knows because his son made themselves vile. Eli knew of the iniquity of his own, of his, of his own observation, by his own observation and from the reports of the people, but especially because God made it known by the message of the man of God. And he did not restrain them. He didn't, he didn't restrain them. He didn't care to do it. He didn't care to do that. Even though he was a prophet to the people, he was called to the people. So that does not mean because you are called to the people that you want to be obedient to God. We want to pick and choose. We want to say, I want to do it for that person, but I don't want to do it for that person. Oh Lord, I can't speak that word of the Lord because that's too intense. Oh Lord, I don't want to speak that word of the Lord because that's too soft. We are either serving God or God is serving us. We have to choose what we're going to do because um, if we don't want our words to fail, we have to do it God's way. If God has called us, God wants to train us so that he can utilize us to its full capacity. And so Eli's responsibility to restrain his sons was not only or even mainly because he was their father. These were adult sons, no longer under Eli's authority as they were when they were younger. Eli's main responsibility to restrain his sons were there, was as their boss because he was the high priest and his sons were priests under his supervision. However, Eli's indulgence towards his sons as a boss was no doubt connected to his prior indulgence of them as parents. The iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. What a terrible judgment this means. It's too late. This is what this means here. It's too late. Everything has a deadline and we have to remember that things have a deadline and we have to know that when God wants to speak to us to some, some, about something we can say, and I'll just use this example. And it's a little extreme. If, if God has called you to be a ballerina and you spend 40 years and you know, and it's clear that God wants you to train to be a ballerina. And so you decide 40 years later that you're going to respond to the Lord because your life was kind of dull and boring and now you want to be a ballerina. Except now you are um, a little old to be a ballerina and a little heavy to be a ballerina. And so now you want to respond. Sometimes it's too late. It is too late. It is too late to do. We have to respond to God. And that's how God is training us. And especially during this time, this Joshua generation that we're living in, we can't afford to give the word of the Lord the way we wanted to do or to hit and miss like like we did 40 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago. God wants, he is training his people to be sniper sharp because, let me tell you something, because especially, especially in these last few years, things that have taken place and false prophets rising up and giving the word of the Lord that was false, people are turned off by your thus say of the Lord. People are turned off by your aggression. They're turned off by it. And so we have to be laser. Now when you're giving the word of the Lord, people are looking for accuracy. They're looking for it being on point. They're not look, looking for your antics with semantics. They're not looking for your drama. They're looking for us to be sniper sharp sharp when we give the word of the Lord. That's what, And God is training us to do that. And how are we trained? We are trained in the camp. 
We are trained in the camp of trials and tribulation. So the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. What a terrible judgment this means. It, it means it's too late. Now the opportunity for repentance has passed. The judgment is sealed. I don't have time to wait. What God is telling me to do, I am not 20 years old. I'm going to go back to this. I keep. I know I keep pausing. I'm not 20 years old. I don't have um, 50, 60, 70 years anymore. I'm, I'm an older woman. So I don't want to play with around with things that I played around with when I was 20 or when I was a teenager. I don't. And you shouldn't either. You, you should do it, especially this latter part of your life. God promises that the latter part of our life will be better than the former part. Let me tell you what that does not mean. It does not mean, mean that you can be disobedient. You can do what you want when you want to do it. You can respond to the Lord the way that you want to do it. God can say to you, you need to forgive. And you can say not now. Or God says to you, um, don't spend money um, frivolously, and you can say, well, God gave us an abundance so we can spend it. We can't play those games. We can't. If you want the latter part of your life to be better than the former part, let's work together with God. It is a blessing that God allows us to work together with him. That's a blessing. I mean, think of who you are. Think of who we are. I know who we want to make people think we are something that we're not, but who we, who we really are. I mean, God came after us. God came up. We weren't seeking God. God came after us. He came after really a, a wicked and impetuous group of people. Well, I know we say that in Habakkuk because God said that about the, um, the Chaldeans. But, but before we came to the kingdom of light, we were wicked and we had impetuous ways. We weren't seeking after God in our wickedness. We were again. We were against God. We were one of those that were that were hurled out. Crucify him. Crucify him. That was us. And God, rich in his mercy and loving kindness, said, this one is mine. Sharon is mine. Timothy is mine. Frederick is mine. Tracy is mine. Yes, because God loves us just that much. But we have to work together with God and do God things God's way. Probably the judgment declared, declared by the man of God in 1 Samuel was a warning inviting repentance because there was no repentance there was no repentance confirmed the judgment uh um it, it, it confirmed the judgment through Samuel or perhaps Eli pleaded that God might withhold his judgment and this is God's answer to that pleading do we ever come to a place where our sin cannot be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever only if we reject the sacrifice of Jesus for our sin in Hebrews 10, 27, it says, if we reject the work of Jesus for us, there is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And in um, verses 15 through 18, Samuel tells Eli the message from God. So Samuel lie down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. He was afraid. He, he wasn't excited about, uh, and we shouldn't be excited. If you have to tell some, some bad news to somebody, if you go and singing, what's wrong with you? Or if you always love rebuking people, something's wrong with you. I mean, Samuel knew to obey God. He knew that he had to obey God at this point. As a young boy, he knew to obey God, but he did it didn't want to go in and say to Samuel what he was what he had to say but he did it anyway and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision then Eli called Samuel and said Samuel my son and he answered here I am and he said what is the word that the Lord spoke to you please do not hide it from me God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. That's interesting that he has that response. Then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Samuel lay down until morning. Of course, he, did, he didn't sleep at all. We see young Samuel lying on his bed, ears tingling as the message from God wondering how he could ever tell Eli such a powerful word of judgment. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli. Open the doors of the house of the Lord presumptuously. <laughs> this was one of Samuel's duties as a servant at the tabernacle. 
Samuel, my son, Eli was not a good, was not a good boss or a good parent, or, or, or he wasn't a good parent either. But Samuel came to him as a, at, a, at a second chance, and Eli did a better job of raising Samuel than he did with his sons of birth. What is the thing that the Lord has said to you? Eli had an idea of what the message of God to Samuel was. Kindly, he took the initi initiative and asked Samuel, knowing it was difficult for the young man to tell him. Eli made it clear to Samuel. He had the responsibility to bring the message, even if it was bad news, with a threat like God do so to you, God do so to you, and more also. Samuel was suitably motivated, excuse me, to tell Eli everything. Eli was admirable because he was willing to be taught from an unexpected source. He wanted to hear the bad news of his condition, and he wanted to hear all God's message at this point. When Samuel told, um, when Samuel told him everything, how hard it is to bring a message of judgment. There may be a few with hard hearts like Jonah, who was happy to announce God's judgment, but most people find it difficult. Most normal people do. Yet it is always the responsibility of God's messenger to bring everything that God says, not just the easy words, not just what you want. Listen to that. It is our job to say it the way God said it, not to put our spin on it. It is the Lord. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. It is hard to know if Eli's response was godly or um, fatalistic. We should always submit to God's rod of correction. Yet, yet this submission is not totally passive. It is also active in repentance and in doing what one can do to cultivate a godly sorrow. Listen to that, because a godly sorrow must come with repentance. I mean, sometimes you will have people, you know, crying, oh, I'm sorry, oh, Father. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about that crap. I'm not talking about that fake stuff. I'm talking about a godly sorrow that you are so broken on the inside. You're saying, saying God, if you don't be the lifter of my head, I'm not going to make it. I need you. I mean, there's a godly sorrow, and God, re, God expects that when it comes with repentance. So let me back up here. Samuel matured and is established as a prophet. And in verses 19 through 20, Samuel grows maturing physically and spiritually. This is how we grow, men, mature spiritually and physically. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. I love that. And all Israel from Dan to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord was with him. Nothing compares to this, to have and to know, to have the Lord with you. The Christians, excuse me, the Christian can know God is with them. The Christian that know God is with him. If God is for us, who can be against us? It says in um, Romans 8.31, you remember that. Let none of his words fall to the ground. This means all of Samuel's prophecies came to pass. And I love this. I, I love this. And I'm gleaning from this because I love this. I love that none of his, none of his words fell. I love that. This means all of Samuel's prophecies came to pass and were known to be true words from God. Therefore, all Israel knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Since the days of Moses, some 400 years before the time of Samuel, there were not only prophets in Israel and certainly no great prophets. At this important time in Israel history, God raised up Samuel as a prophet. Coming in the place in Israel's history, Samuel is rightly seen as Israel's last judge and first prophet. Samuel bridges the gap between the time of the judges and the time of the monarchy when prophets such as Nathan, Elijah, and Isaiah influenced the nations. From Dan to Beersheba, this is 
a way of saying from from northernmost Israel to the southernmost Israel. It is a similar similar idea as saying as as you would say from the United States in the United States we would, we, we would say from New York to California. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. Then the Lord appeared again in in um, Shiloh, Shiloh, from the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The Lord appeared again. When, when, when did the Lord first appear in Shiloh? We now, we know he appeared to Samuel in first Samuel three ten. Now in some undescribed way, the Lord appears again. The Lord, uh, the, the, excuse me, the Lord reveals himself by the word of the Lord. God reveals himself by the word. Whenever God is moving, he will reveal himself by the word of the Lord. Now in 2 Kings 6 um, verses 13 through 23, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Listen, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fires and around Elisha. And the enemy came down towards him. Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness. As Elisha had asked, Elisha told them, this is not the road. This is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man who the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that, so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them? <laughs> shall I kill them? My father, shall I kill them? Do not kill them, the Lord said, he answered. Would you kill those who have captured, you have captured with your own sword and bow? And bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their read. In 1 Samuel 3, um, three, it reads, Eli didn't know God. He presumed that that we we presume that because people have been because we know that people can be members of churches for a long time, or we can quote Bible verses, and especially if it's phonetically correct and have every the thou and though in place that 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 that's significant to us that a person has a relationship with God. Well, it's not. It doesn't mean that. Even you singing on a choir, you can be a pastor of a church, you can be a member of the church. It does not mean you have a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God is having a relationship with God. It can't be faked. Eli, like we, can do, Eli, like we, can do, can do, was, was not sensitive. His sensitivity to the spirit was off. Our spiritual senses must regularly get a tune up. They must get developed. You can sing in a choir, you can feed the poor, you can feed the hungry, but you can still have your senses, but you still still need your senses trained and to be up to date. Like you don't eat, you don't eat and get full today and don't eat again until next week or next year from now, for, or a year from now. Until next year or next week, you don't say, I'm going to eat then. I'm not going to eat again today. I'm not going to eat anymore until then. You, you, you just won't do that. You won't be strong enough. You may remember how chicken tastes, but benefiting from the nutrients may be dull and void. You won't benefit from it. You'll just remember something. You may be able to quote the scripture. You may be able to quote a prophecy you've got, or you may be able to do all of that, but your sensitivity to the spirit of God can be dull, will be dull if this is the case. Peter knew Jesus, and this is another example. Peter knew Jesus, but didn't know God. The storm, Jesus rebuked Peter. During the storm, Jesus, um, Jesus rebuked Peter. 
His senses were undeveloped. He woke up Jesus over, he woke Jesus up over the storm that he, that he was, should have been able to handle. He should have been able to ha handle that. That should not have caused him to fret that particular trial. Don't cover up your reaction to situations under the guise of I'm only human. That's funny, but you want what, but you want that same God to do something supernatural, to do su supernatural things for, for you in your life when it's convenient. Now you want to be natural. I'm only human. I mean, I made a mistake. Come on, get over it. Get over it, Sharon. I just made a mistake. But you want a supernatural God to help you get out of, uh, out of situations. So you have to pick what side of the coin, what side are you going to play on? Is it the, uh, are you going to walk in a carnal position and you're going to, you know, what are you going to do? We have to choose. Are we going to walk with God or not? Are we going, are we going to, when we hear the word of God, God, are we going to work together with God until that word is needed in us? Or are we going to hear the word this morning and then we're going to walk away from it? Like it says in James, you look in the mirror, you see who you are, but as soon as you walk away, you forget. Is that how we're going to handle the scriptures? Because if, if we don't apply the word to our situations, and I, and I said that word correctly, apply the word. It's the applied word that works in our life. Not the word that we think about, we read about, we heard about. It's the applied word. And so that word is a bit, we, can, we have access, I'm sorry, for that word being applied when we're in the midst of a trial. If we only cater to our flesh senses, that's all we will develop. If we only cater to our flesh senses, that's the only thing that will be developed. And then we'll put a little sprinkle of spiritual things on it. Yeah, we do that. The Christians, Christians do that a lot. We must develop our spiritual senses. God has orchestrated this trouble. God has orchestrated the trouble that you're in. Listen to this. You may not like this, but, but the trouble that you're in right now or the trouble that you're going, going to be in, God allowed it. It went through the nostrils of God. So if you want to be mad with somebody, you can say, well, I don't like what that person said to me. They should not have said it. But then you have to uh, put an addendum on that. But God permitted it. So if God permitted it, you need to utilize that trial and you need to allow God to train you in it. I mean, I'm in, I'm in a situation. I'm sure you have situations. We all have situations. So in the midst of our situations, we have to say we're going to allow ourselves to be ran by that situation. Because God never said to us that we would never have trials. He said, a matter of fact, he said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. He said, many. He didn't say one or two. He said, many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But he gives us this promise. He says, but from them all, I will deliver you. God is not a liar. He said, from them all, I will deliver you. And God's deliverance is not a barely deliverer. If you have to go through something, and this is in my thinking I mean, I've been thinking this. I've been practicing this for some time. If I have to go through this doggone trial, yes, I said doggone. If I have to go through this doggone trial, I want to come out with some spoil. And sometimes I will come out. I, I don't want to just come out with spoil for myself. I want to come out with spoil. I want to get it for other people too. It's like if I got, if I, if I'm going through this, I want to get some, I want to get some spoil for Tracy. I want to get some spoil for Linda. I want to get some, I want to get some spoil because devil, if, if you had the nerve to attack me, I'm going to teach you that you should not have done that. And so we have to think differently how we think about, um, um, the things of God. We have to challenge, we have to allow God to challenge us in those things because the hidden things are in plain, plain sight of us. They are right around us. God, God, we want to pray for God to send us a word from Timbuktu. I need a prophecy from somewhere. I need, well, prophesy over yourself. Pick up the word and prophesy over yourself. Everything you need is right in front of you. I'm not speaking against prophecy. You going somewhere and receiving the word of the Lord. I love that too. But you can prophesy over yourself. God didn't say to Ezekiel, to um, he didn't say to Ezekiel's friend, prophesy over these bones for Ezekiel. He told Ezekiel to prophesy over those bones. So if you have some dry bones, some dry situations in your life, use your tongue and speak because your tongue is... It has vibrations in it. And so whatever you put out will come back to you. Those vibrations will come back. So if you're putting out 
negative stuff. I can never do it. I am so hurt. I can never overcome this. It won't. Uh, then what, first of all, recognize where you are. God is not going to condemn you for where you are, but you need to recognize where you are, that you're, that you're not where you thought you were. Because in the midst of situations, in the midst of trials, we find out who we are. That's where we find out how weak we are or how strong we are. And if we're finding out how weak we are, it's only because God wants to work together with us to strengthen us. It's not to condemn us or to say, ah, ha, 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 or to say, oh, I knew it. I mean, I hate that word too. I knew it. I knew, well, if you knew everything, why, why, when, excuse me, why when God looked on the whole earth, he said he found no one. <laughs> he didn't say he found you and you and me. He said he found no one. So he sent Jesus to the earth on our behalf because we need him. And so we have to work together with the Holy Spirit. He's equipped us with the Holy Spirit to help us. Let's stop making a game out of this thing. This walk with God. Let's stop making like it's a game. You know, whatever will be, will be. It's it, it's really introspective. I mean, sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. I mean, we can just quote what we want to quote when we want to quote it and expect God to do something very deliberate. Now, we want God to be very deliberate towards us, but we want to be haphazard with him. And it can't be like that. It cannot. There are hidden, there's hidden, hidden in plain sight right around us is everything we need pertaining to life and godliness to live out this abundant life. So if you want to go up to the next level, there are things that we're going to have to drop off along the way. We're not going up to the next level with old baggage, with old things, with old ways of thinking. But we want to prosper. We want to go on. We want to go on in the things of God. But I just want to pull all this stuff with me. I need this stuff. I need this old, torn up, beat up luggage. I need to bring it with me. And God is saying, no, drop it. I'll give you new luggage. I'll give you new stuff. I'll give you new stuff. Because all, the, all things new, when God is de dealing with us, he wants us to go to that next dimension. He wants, he wants us to have everything that um, he's prepared for us. And we can't, if we keep looking back, if we can't keep saying, I can't, or, oh, we don't want to be wrong. That's another one. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want to say we made a mistake in that prophecy. We don't want to say we made a mistake in the way we talk, spoke to somebody or the way we handle somebody. We don't want to be wrong. I'm going to tell you, you can spend your life not wanting to be wrong, not wanting to humble yourself, and you'll get to a place where it's too late. It's too late. Because, it, I, and whatever that too late is, I'm not saying it's too late for God to forgive you because God, God is always rich in loving kindness and mercy. But, but sometimes the deadline for certain things to manifest is over. It is over. And so you're believing the Lord for something. You're believing the Lord for something in your body, for your family, for your kids, for whatever you're believing God for. Everything you need is right around you. And I will say to you, there will be some things that God tells you to do that you don't want to do it. You will not want to do it. That's not the issue. I'm not going to say to you, oh, you're going to want to do everything God tells you to do. Bop, just do it. Some things you are not going to want to do, but you're going to have to do it anyway. You're going to have to want to do it anyway. You can't pick out of the jar what you want. Okay, you pick out, you 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 have these notes in a jar and they're wrapped up and you can't see it and you open it up and it says, okay, um, I need you to love your siblings. Oh, you close it up and put it back in the jar. Oh, not today. And so you're going to ignore that that that. that that, that was taken. And so you're going to put it back in the jar and you're going to reach your hand in it and you're going to pull something out, something else out. And you pull out, um, yes, I am rich in loving kindness and mercy. Oh yes, Jesus, you are rich in loving kindness and mercy. Thank you, God. That's what you died on the cross for. But you're forgetting about the other paper that you took out. That that's accurate too. Even though this feeds your flesh more, you want to think of God in this manner because you don't want to be changed. And so you rather hold on to this form of godliness, even though you've de denied the power of God changing and transforming you. And so you want to hold on to what you want to hold on. But when you need something from God, you want him to be sniper sharp. You want him to give you what you, what you want, when you want it, and you want it right now, or you want to be mad and you're angry. It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to recognize that God doesn't need us to be God for him. He's God all by himself. And I want to read something to you before I close. And I'll, I'll be talking about this some more next week because I still have 
more notes here, but listen to this. There's a reason that the Bible refers to water a hun hundreds of times in the Bible. We have a continual thirst that needs to be satisfied. Our bodies themselves are made up of water. In fact, women's bodies are made up of 50% water. 50%, can you believe that? Crops will not grow without water, and without them, we have no substance. Water is the source of life for us. Jesus refers to himself as the living water, and isn't it a fantastic analogy? When we have thirst for water, we drink, and it restores our body. When we have a drought in our spiritual life, we need only to seek God, and he will restore our soul. We never need to desire anything else but him, because he will satisfy our spiritual dryness for our entire lives. We will never thirst again. Um, in Isaiah 12, 3, it says, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Are you drinking from the cup that Jesus is offering you today? Are you drinking from it? Are you saying, this is me, I need this? Or are you seeking out other things to dampen the drought in your life before you seek him? Everything needs water to survive, but God doesn't merely want survival for you. He wants to give you a supernatural quenching quenching of the th of the thirst in your life. God doesn't just want you to survive. He wants you to thrive. God wants us to thrive in these last days. He doesn't want uh, he doesn't want us running away from trials because you notice in the Bible there's no armor for our back. There's only armor armor for when we stand up to something and we face it head, head on. We have armor for that, but we don't have armor for running away. We don't have armor for, and God wants us. He wants us. He wants to work together with us. He wants to give us everything we need that we're, that we're fortified. We need to be fortified here on the earth because things aren't getting any better. They're getting worse. And so you have to be fortified. So we have to work together with God. Either you're going to get weaker or stronger. And God says that he wants us to get stronger. He said that as we wait upon the Lord, that we would grow, we would mount up like eagles and we would get stronger. If you're not getting stronger, you have to challenge that thing and say, why? Why am I not getting stronger? There's nothing wrong in heaven. God provided everything we need. he need. He's not dying on the cross again. Everything we need is right around us. It is right around us. And so if it's not being utilized, if we're not seeking God so we can use it, so it can manifest in our life, then that's not God's fault. That's our fault for not coming because everything we need pertaining to life and godliness is right, right in front of us. It is right in front of us. And so will you not come and say, God, will you not come today and say, God, um, um, every, everything that you've given to us is right before me. And Father, I want to utilize it. This lady is saying this to me. And Father, I have to go beyond that is Sharon Gainsley talking to me. And I want to talk to you, God. I want to talk to you about the things that are hidden, hidden in my plain sight that I don't see. So that means you can't say, I know, I know, I know, because you don't see it, so you're lying. There are things that are hitting, hidden in front of you that you don't see. And you're wondering, how come I'm not overcoming in this situation? How come I still have this anger problem? How come I still have this manipulation problem? How come I have still have this problem in not trusting? How, how come I'm not seeing myself clearly? How come I don't love myself any more than I love? How come? Then we, need, then we have to come back to his throne room, and we have to say, hey, God, you have provided everything for me, and it's hidden in my plain sight. Guide me, lead me, help me. So thank you for joining me today. I'm being summoned that my time is up, but I am so glad. And please allow God to work together with you because I'll say this. I say it on every podcast. And when we hear the word, we're always thrust into situations where that word is tested, where God can work together with us. So I'll see you next week, and I love you, and thank you for joining me. Bye-bye.